Welcome everybody to our June 1st CPUG meeting. It's been a big week for Power BI um, and Fabric with the build conference that just happened last week. So we've got some pretty exciting content today. Um, I'm gonna kick it off with a really quick group intro for any people who, um, if this is their first time joining or they haven't joined us in a while, um, can hear what we're all about. So, um, our group intro, who we are, we are CPUG. We're a group of Power BI enthusiasts um, in the Seattle area with a west side focus because there is a east side um, user group as well. Um, but that does not mean we are limited to see the Seattle area. Um, if you want to drop where you're calling in from in the chat, we love to see how far the, the group has reached um, each session. And we just want to be an inviting, inspiring, good-natured community to help um, learn from each other and grow and connect with other people in the Power BI community. Um, for this meeting, we ask that um, if you're willing to be on recording and visible, um, we'd love to see cameras on and see your smiling faces. Um, and then just a reminder to be uh, friendly and welcoming and respectful to everyone around you. Um, we're hoping for this to be an, a pretty interactive um, Q&A session. So, um, mm -hmm. Reminder to be respectful of different questions and viewpoints. Um, and then finally, if you have any interest in getting involved, um, we have a survey link that's posted to our meetup page that um, at any point, if you wanna provide um, anonymous feedback, you can go through that link. Um, you're also welcome to reach out to any of our leadership team. Um, that would be myself, Andrew, uh, Russ, Gaston, Wesley, and we have an exciting announcement about a new member on our leadership team is Emily Scarmuzzi, so welcome her. Um, and yeah, so if you if you have any feedback or you know you want to do a, a presentation, we love um, hearing from our community and having y'all get involved. Um, and if you're interested in something like that, feel free to reach out to any of us. Now I will pass it over to Gaston to introduce our speaker for today. Okay, uh, yeah, this is Gaston Cruz here. Uh, I am glad that Justina uh, Luxnik uh, agreed to present for us for the second time. Uh, we've been pitching her for a long time. <laughs> So uh, yeah, this is this is gonna be great in terms of you know, and uh, this is a little bit of you know, kind of a setting the stage here. We were discussing before we shown this meeting in terms of you know roadmaps on the data analytics framework for Microsoft for the last few years or so. So a lot of switching from different roles, different personas. How we are trying to embrace every single member and empower citizen developers to come in with all these new tools. The first uh, thing that I did when I moved from Uruguay, South America to Seattle, I went to the Advanta office, uh, the office of uh, the Power BI team at that time, and they were amazing, kind of uh, the way they welcome in uh, me and knowing them, just interchanging emails with Justina, with Kim, with Arun, with a bunch of people from the team. They were amazing. And uh, after this build announcement, they came in with a really amazing news around what is coming, what is going on with the data analytics framework. So welcome in Justina again. I'm really happy to that you can join us today and happy to welcome in. Thank you so much. Okay, awesome. So firstly, really excited to be here and to be, you know, chatting with all of you, uh, you know, it's really great to get Microsoft Fabric out into public preview and finally be able to talk about all the things we've been working on for the last uh, two years almost. Uh, so for today, uh, I really want this to be a super interactive session and I want to make sure we cover the content that all of you are interested in. I certainly have a presentation and I can fill up this whole hour going through what Microsoft Fabric is all about, kind of introducing you to, to the new platform. Uh, but, you know, maybe firstly, before we jump in, just like as a show of hands, if you can raise your hand just so I can kind of see the numbers more or less. How many of you are familiar with Microsoft Fabric? How many of you have um, maybe seen the sessions um, at the from Build? 
uh, saw like the keynotes and stuff. Okay, wow. Um, next, okay, I'm seeing quite a lot of about 12, 12 or so hands up, so 14. Okay, so um, pretty much, I would say almost all of you, I think are kind of familiar with it. So that's awesome to see. So then I think we can kind of jump in to the content, assuming that there is, you know, some foundational knowledge around what, what Fabric is all about. Uh, so, you know, what I'm really would, planning to doing is taking you through this presentation similar to what we went through with like Arun and Amir at the keynote. That keynote was very fast. We basically condensed what we usually do in 90 minutes to 45 minutes because they only gave us a 45 minute slot. So uh, it was pretty fast paced um, and really kind of just introduce the core concepts again and maybe have a little bit of a chat with all of you and see if you have any questions about them, if there's things you want to learn more about, think about how it relates to Power BI, anything like that. Um, I'm happy to kind of Again, make this make this super interactive. Um, so let me jump in to the presentation. And we're here. OK, and so I'm going to uh, kind of, you know, just as the framing, you know, what was the motivation behind Microsoft Fabric? How did it all kind of come about, you know? When we look at the architectures that our customers put together, we often see things that kind of look something like this, right? Like these are sort of uh, architectures that we've seen in our customer case studies. These are all part of customer stories that have been published uh, online. And, you know, the common theme around them is there's lots of complexity, right? There's all of these different subsystems that need to come together. Um, and essentially, as Arun kind of mentioned, I think in um, his keynote, right, it's it's really about wanting to simplify, you know, I'm the chief data officer, I don't want to be the chief integration officer. And really, that was kind of a lot of the motivation and thinking behind Fabric is how do we take um, all of these different components? Uh, we know that these have predictable patterns, right? We know that everyone is doing some data integration. There's always, you know, generally some data warehousing. There might be some data science. There's always generally power or business intelligence. There might be different flavors or different emphasis on these different pieces. But ultimately, we have all of these building, building blocks. From a Microsoft perspective, we actually have investments in all of these different places. So how do we go from this collection of products, which is still too complicated in terms of stitching up because there's different business models, some of them are platform pass, some of them are SaaS, there's different expertise needed for these, and really go into, um, you know, essentially a complete analytics platform, which is what Microsoft Fabric is all about. Um, so I'm going to skip through the build because, again, I just want to kind of make sure we get through all the content. But if I look at, you know, what Fabric is all about and the, and the pillars that we've been emphasizing, right, like in the keynote, is firstly, the main takeaway is really it's about bringing together and building a complete analytics platform end to end. Right. So we have all of these different workloads that are coming together into a single platform. And we'll go through this in a little bit more detail. The whole platform is built around being lake centric and open. So it's really about bringing data into a common open format. And that is really, really important for being able to ensure that once data comes in once, you don't have to keep duplicating it or having various ETL jobs copying the data around. It just stays in this sort of open format. We want to be able to bridge the gaps between information workers and the data developers. So how do we bring these two worlds closer and closer together? Is you know, we've already been doing this a lot with Power BI, with um, all of the um, different uh, like office integrations, teams integrations. So it's really building on top of that and bringing along the whole data uh, platform with it. And then, um, you know, definitely a big theme that we're investing a lot in and you're going to be seeing more and more about that later is the AI power, the fact that this is an AI powered platform, right? So we want to uh, infuse co-pilot experiences across the entire stack. Okay, so let's jump in and talk a little bit about, let's unravel and un what, what does it mean to have this complete analytics platform? So currently we have different products in the market. We have the Synapse product, we have the Power BI product, we have Data Factory, Data Activator here on the side is a completely new offering. And we're basically bringing them all together into the single unified data platform with Microsoft Fabric. Uh, so this basically means that, uh, you know, it, Sometimes some people, when they look at this and, and they saw the keynote, they're like, OK, this is like a Cortana analytics situation, right, where you're kind of like rebrand, like it's a marketing message. You're saying, hey, these are all part of some marketing suite. And, 
you know, uh, and that's sometimes the takeaway when when uh, people kind of see like, okay, the, these products are brought together. But here I really want to emphasize that this is not some rebranding. This has been two years of engineering work to do redo the plumbing and actually figure out how all of these different um, roles and responsibilities, whether I'm doing data engineering or uh, warehousing or real-time analytics, truly are going to come together into a single shared platform. So this, you know, the platform is um, completely shared across all of these different artifacts, right? So if I come in and let's say create myself a new workspace, um, I can go in and, and, you know, we can kind of take a quick look at this. Like if we just, uh, let me jump in and uh, actually we can, we can take a quick look at uh, fabric over here. Um, and if I, okay. So, you know, over here, if we're starting from somewhere like Power BI, right? And this is, again, you're all coming from the Power BI world. So this all should look very familiar. Right, you know, you have your Power BI, you kind of you have all your different workspaces, you can jump in and everything. It looks and feels just like Power BI. Um, but now, you know, inside my Power BI workspace, if I go and essentially see all the different artifacts I can create, uh, if I actually go and say show all and go into the Create Hub, you can see that, yes, I have all of my Power BI artifacts, like my reports and my data sets, but now I also have data science artifacts, right? So I've got my models and I've got experiments and I've got notebooks. Um, and I can go and build, let's say, a data pipeline, or I can build, do real-time analytics, uh, or build out my warehouse. And so all of these are truly part of a, a shared a shared workspace, right, where um, all of these different things can coexist. Uh, similarly, um, if I, let's say, in this particular case, I'm a Power BI user, I want to have a Power BI focus, but I can jump into something like my Synapse Data Engineering Experience. And now, uh, it's still the same platform. It's not a different product. It's just that the lens at which I'm looking at the workspace or at the product at is more from a data engineering perspective, right? So the things that I now have recommended if I jump into uh, my workspace over here and let's go and navigate to uh, something like this is, you know, you can see that it's more, it looks a little bit different than the Power BI one, right? I see like things like my lake house and my notebook. Um, and but you can see my reports show up here too. Like it's it's all part of a single shared workspace. It's just now I happen to also be able to build notebooks and lake houses in the same place. Um, now if I look at something like my notebook, right, and I go into my settings, you're gonna see very similar constructs to what we had with let's say things like reports, right? I can set my sensitivity labels. I've got my endorsements. I can schedule my notebook just like I can schedule my data set, right? So. Um, these components are shared, right? So if I schedule any artifact in Fabric, I am familiar with that experience because it's, it's a continuous component that is shared across all of these different artifacts. Um, you know, there's other things that are coming, uh, such as CI/CD. It's not available yet for other uh, artifacts. It's available for, for Power BI works, uh, things that, that was one of the build announcements. So the way I'm going to do CI/CD is going to be the same across all of these different artifacts. If I jump into the monitoring hub, you know, now I have a central monitoring. This is again new, new addition, right? But I can monitor my pipelines and my notebooks, um, and you know, my all my different artifacts in in exactly the same way, right? So I have a central place. Now, if I jump into my notebook, maybe the second page of the monitoring hub will look a little bit different because it's going to be more focused on things like monitoring my Spark applications and Spark jobs. But we have again a central kind of as much centralized as makes sense, basically. Um, the One Lake Data Hub, right? Uh, so the Data Hub has been rebranded into the One Lake. We'll talk more about One Lake. But now, you know, this shows me things like my lake houses and warehouses alongside my Power BI data sets. And uh, if I jump into something like uh, my lake house over here, you can see that the experience, again, feel, looks and feels very similar to what I would see with a data set. Uh, maybe some of the actions I can take is a little bit different. Maybe some of the related artifacts are different because now I have a, I can have a notebook associated with Lake House. I can't have that associated with a data set. But again, the look and feel feels very similar. So that's one thing I really wanted to emphasize, right, is all of these shared components, whether it's shared workspaces, the universal compute, one security, one lake, navigation, security model, monitoring hub, are, are, truly, are truly shared. And these are all part of a single common platform. Um, the, uh, you know, 
The, the other key here, and again, from coming from the Power BI world, you'll, you'll be used to this, is it is SaaS, right? So we have SaaSified a lot of these experiences. We want to make the onboarding and the starting and the ramp up really easy. Um, we want to have as much performance by default. Uh, we will still have knobs because there are uh, customers who will, you know, if I talk to a Spark data engineer, they want to have the ability to go and customize things with your Spark cluster, and, and that's okay. We will have those uh, capabilities. But if a user doesn't want to care about those things and all they want to do is create a new notebook, they don't have to worry about them. Uh, and again, centralized administration. So we have tenant-wide governance. Um, compliance is just built in. You can set up your admin settings uh, across the entire tenant and, and things just all kind of will roll up because you can't really create a workspace that's not under the governance of that of that central tenant. It's a very strong tenant concept, similar to what we have in Power BI, what we have in Office. Um, so uh, let's take a look uh, just in terms of, again, that SaaS concept. If um, let me just navigate to another workspace over here. Uh, and I think I have capacity assigned to it. So if I let's say over here I go in, um, let's say create myself a new notebook, uh, you'll see I just get navigated instantly into the notebook, right? If you're used to coming from somewhere like the Synapse world, I would have had to go and say, okay, before I do this, I'm going to have to go and create myself a Spark pool. And I'm going to have to answer a bunch of questions about the Spark pool in terms of the size and networking and storage accounts and, uh, you know, fill out a five page questionnaire before I can go and, you know, do anything over here. Um, and with, with, in terms of Fabric, the concept of SaaS is we abstract away a lot of that, right? At this point, um, okay, if I go and say, you know, write something silly, I can just go and start running these things and I didn't have to do anything to set this up, right? And things just start to run. We, again, automatically have things like uh, Spark clusters pre-provision, so things start to run pretty quickly. And again, in the past, like maybe this would have taken five minutes for the session to start up. You can see the session got started in less than 10 seconds. I know in the Power BI world, you might be thinking 10 seconds to actually get things running. Well, my reports, I expect them to be up in like two seconds, right? But again, um, we're coming from <laughs> slightly different worlds. We're kind of trying to bring these two worlds together. Uh, in this case, you know, having a 10 second startup time in the past world is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's really great about bringing and, and kind of making it a lot easier for, for people to get onboarded and get started in the platform. And again, for the users who care and want to dig into the workspace settings and want to go into the Spark compute and want to say, you know what, I don't want this starter pool you're giving me. I want to go create my own pool and I want to go and configure all my Spark cluster information. That's all still there. So you can still go and configure things um, for the advanced users. Um, but if a user never wants to care about these things and they want to, they don't want to think about compute, they don't have to. And that's, I think, how we're trying to bring these, these two different worlds uh, together. Uh, okay, and then the last thing on this is we've touched upon this already, these persona optimized experiences where you will have these different, as we call them, front doors. Um, it's the same platform, it's the same experiences. It's just if you're a data scientist, you might want the things that are kind of popping up top of mind for you to be slightly different than what the data warehouse user cares about, which is maybe what the Power BI user cares about. Okay, so that's kind of like, I'm going to skip through the demo because uh, we kind of showed the demo to keynotes. So don't want to necessarily play the same demo again. Uh, just want to see if there's any questions at this point, just about this first section of these different workloads all coming together to the same platform. Um, any any questions on, on this one or anything I can help clarify or or maybe feedback if you've already tried it and um, you know you have some thoughts about maybe how it works today or how we could possibly improve it for the future. Uh, yeah, Russ, I think you've got your hand up. Go for it. Hey, Justina. Yeah, I had a question yesterday um, from a group that I was working with, and the question was, in Fabric, if we've got different data that we would like to discover, you know, maybe someone's built a, a data warehouse over here, over there, mm -hmm. how do we discover things so that we're not replicating something that's already been done? I mean, I know in Power BI, we can promote something and then certify mm -hmm. it. Is it a similar pattern that we're going to see in Fabric? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And yeah, absolutely. I think that's another thing that we want to keep that sort of consistency about, right? So if we jump into the One Lake Data Hub over here, so generally the Data Hub is the place where we have that data discovery, uh, where we want to come in and, and discover all the data that we have access to. Uh, and so just like, you know, with my data set over here, you can see this is a certified data set. Um, with my Lake House, and if we jump into 
uh, my lake house, the workspace over here for a second. Um, let's make sure this is loading. Or if it's not, that's totally fine. We can go into a different workspace. Again, it's still, still a little bit early days. Uh, but if we jump into uh, perhaps another workspace where let's find one where I do have a lake house, probably here, uh, you will be able to see, again, if I jump into the settings, that I can go and promote my lake houses, certify my lake houses, just like I can do with my data sets. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we also, when it comes to things like sensitivity labels, we want to do is um, if, let's say, my lake house is considered highly confidential, and then I build a data set on top of that, the data set will automatically inherit those labels and be highly confidential too, because we want to ensure that, you know, the uh, the most, the highest kind of common sensitivity label, let's say, gets carried through, so things like that. So, uh, yeah, one, and, and the cool thing about the One Lake Data Hub, one thing, just one last thing I wanted to add about it is, it's actually going to be more tightly integrated into the entire product um, in different places, right? So if, for example, I'm in my notebook, and I want to use some data that's my, maybe in a lake house, um, I can really easily just go over here and add a lake house reference. Uh, and this will just now give me an embedded view of the data hub with all that, all that information, such as the endorsements, the sensitivity labels. Um, and now I can say, you know what, I want to actually pin maybe this, uh, let's, let's pin this mercury, you know, lake house um, onto the side. And now I can say, yeah, let's see this over here. And I, now I can just interact with this lake house, drag my data into my notebook um, and so on. Uh, and so um, in this particular case, we do have a limitation where it has to be within the same workspace. So just be mindful of that. We're working through that. Um, but, you know, I can basically uh, have that data hub be more integrated into and data, do data discovery within the context of me as a user. Um, Thank you for the question. I see some other questions on the chat, so let's go through those. So one question here is, how do you manage the permissions of artifacts other than reports? Uh, that's a great question. So permissions is, of course, a super important topic. So there's a couple of different levels of permissions. One level is just what you have, uh, which you're already used to, right, in Power BI, which is if I go into manage access um, and I go and add people to the workspace. I can add someone's an admin, member, contributor, viewer, um, and those roles will propagate through to all of the different artifacts inside the workspace, right? So we're going to be adding some additional specific permissions for um, the specific artifacts. So, for example, for notebooks, we're working on like a permission that's going to come a little bit later where as a viewer, you could, for example, have read permission, but then you could also have something like uh, run permissions, right? You can't maybe edit the code, but maybe you can run the code, right? So uh, there'll be some more granular permissions or for the lake house, we'll have like, okay, can you read when you can, when we say you, you're a uh, viewer, can you actually read the SQL endpoint or can you read all the data that's even in the lake, right? So we'll have like more granular permissions like that. Uh, just like in Power BI, you have like the build permission, right? So if I um, go into, let's say, my data set settings and I've got um, all of the different uh, permissions somewhere here, and I'm just trying to, as you can see, I'm doing this a little bit on the fly, so I'm trying to remember exactly. But um, I know there's a place where if we jump into, I think it's because it's a default data set. Let's go into another data set over here. Okay, yeah, if we go to manage permissions here, right, I can go and say, you know what, these are the different permissions that a particular user has. So I can remove free share, remove build, and so on. We'll, we're gonna have that kind of granularity on the various different artifacts. On top of that, we also have data permissions, right? So data permissions are really important and that's where um, to kind of jump a little bit between things. Um, the concept of one lake comes in. We'll talk about one lake in just a second, but we have this concept of one security. Um, and so the idea would be that I could set up, for example, object level permissions on my lake house tables, right? So if we jump into um, a lake house over here, like um, let's jump back over here for a second. 
and if we jump into our lake house, imagine that over here, what you could, you'd be able to do is basically say, okay, um, for example, I have, imagine I had more tables than just the account table, but you know, for the account table, let's say Gaston is able to view this table, um, but he can't view another table in the, in the uh, imaginary table in this lake house. Uh, you know, the the thing with one security is that if I access that data through the warehouse, if I access that data through Power BI, uh, that uh, security, one security would be carried through. So that's something that we're working on. It's going to come around GA time. Uh, and we're going to start with object level security and file folder level security. So that means I'll be able to secure the tables and I'll be able to secure any files and folders. Um, and yeah, you apply security once and then that security gets carried through the entire, um, you know, whether I'm in here, whether I'm in the SQL endpoint, whether I am in my Power BI data set and so on. So that's kind of like the um, permission management piece. Um, okay, just scrolling up um, through the questions, is Fabric intended to be a tool set that supports the concept of managing data as a data mesh? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So yes, data mesh is very central to uh to fabric and maybe what i'll actually do oh if you can see, you can see my uh, desktop background is the beautiful artwork um done by some people in our community of the whole map of uh of fabric which i absolutely loved um sorry this is a complete side note uh but let's maybe just spend a minute so making sure everyone's on the same page around what is the lake centric architecture and then we'll talk about data mesh as well so um, lake centric, uh, what we mean by lake centric is we think of, uh, we, well, all of every single workload in Fabric, right, um, as we've said, is part of the shared platform. And inside the shared platform, we also have the concept of shared storage, which is called one lake. So Fabric automatically comes pre-wired with one lake, which is a unified SaaS data lake for the entire organization. Um, and essentially it means that whether I'm writing my data using Spark with data engineering or warehouse with a SQL, all of this data is going to go into, it's automatically going to get stored in, in one lake in, inside the workspace, uh, inside of different folders. Um, and yeah, so basically over here, you can see that it doesn't matter if I'm going through Spark, through SQL, QQL, AS, this data is going to go into one lake. And the really key thing here is it's not only going to one link, but it's actually going into one link in a shared common format, which is the Delta Parquet format. And this is an open format, right, that many others use in the industry. Databricks uses it too. Um, and this is where also this one security applies, right, where once I, let's say, secure the data once, um, that data can is secured across the board. And the, real, the thing with... Um, with one lake is because all of this data is in the same common format, it means that I can reuse the data across the entire stack. So I only have to bring in the data once, and then that data can be reused, whether I'm using it via Spark or Power BI, it doesn't matter, right? So if I've written the data using Spark um, into one lake, and now I want to read it from Power BI, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to import the data. Um, the data will just be read automatically. Um, Okay, so we're going to skip through the demos again, but uh, how is this all related? So, okay, so once we have the data available, we we, we really are trying to, we, we have these different data artifacts, right? We have our lake houses, we have our warehouses, we have our data sets, and we want to be able to provide data as a product for the entire organization. And so um, if we actually, I don't believe, let me see if this is already available inside the one lake data hub. If not, I'm going to, no, it's not available here yet. But okay, let me actually, sorry, to answer that question, I'm gonna just open up a older presentation where I can show you a little bit of a graphic around what that data mesh concept looks like here. So just bear with me. I was on, I'm sure I had one here. And if I can't find it, it's fine. I'll just describe it. It's not a big deal. Mm. Nope. 
I'm sorry, I did not say it, but basically um, we're going to introduce the concept of domains, which is, again, a very kind of key concept for data mesh, right? So what you'll be able to do, for example, is set up like a marketing domain. And then you'll be able to say, OK, as part of my marketing domain, I have like my marketing lake house and I have my marketing data product and then I'm going to give access. And so you can think of the hierarchy as domain and then workspaces are under domains. And then I'll be able to say all of these different workspaces roll up to the marketing domain and I might give access to some people for the marketing domain, but they don't necessarily have access to the sales domain or the HR domain. Right. So in your one leg data hub, which you'll be able to see. And I wonder if we already have a working build of this. I'm just going to sorry, I'm just improvising at the moment. We'll see. But if we jump into somewhere like one leg data hub. Uh, no, I don't see it. OK, sorry. But, you know, you'll be able to, for example, filter down and say, OK, uh, maybe I have access to the marketing and sales domain. I can go and see the marketing domain and see all the data products that have been shared with me. And I think that's the other core concept when it comes to permissions is I don't have to add someone to my workspace in order to give them access to the marketing data. Right. I can just say, hey, I'm going to go in just like I have with a data set. I can share my data set out. I'll be able to share the lake house with you know certain people and then they'll be able to discover that data. Um, and so it's kind of allowing you to have that much more kind of decentralized way of working and having and giving access to data to individuals to be able to go and build out things like their reports and so on. So uh, data mesh is a very important concept for us. And you're going to see more and more like um, uh, constructs like things like domains built into the product to support that kind of data mesh architecture. Um, OK, so does Fabric integrate more closely with certain uh, with a certain data lake like Spark, Databricks, or Cosmos. Uh, so um, you can think of, there's two sides to Fabric. There's the inside Fabric, we have all of the different compute engines that we uh, offer, right? Which is the ones that we were kind of looking at here. We These are things that are just built into Fabric. Um, and these are just, you get Fabric, you can get access to all of these different um, experiences. And over time, we're going to add more and more native experiences into the product. And for us to have a native experience, it means they have to be 100% tightly integrated into the entire platform, right? Which which is all of those pieces I was showing you earlier, right? The All of these things. Like that means that is something is like a native Fabric experience. When we integrate with all these things, they show up in the product and we have that as an engine. One Lake itself, um, it's just an ADLS storage account with a bunch of goodness built into it. But ultimately, it's still ADLS Gen 2 is a storage account. You can use it with accessing ADLS Gen 2 APIs. You can explore it through your Azure Data Explorer. So it's completely open, right? So if you want to work with something like a different Spark engine or you want to work with Databricks or like uh, you know something else, you can just access the data directly in one leg, read and write to it. We will discover it and uh, it's you know completely open. And a really important concept with one link as well is this concept of shortcuts. So um, I'm gonna jump into shortcuts over here, right? Which is basically that um, you don't even have to copy the data into one link. So if I want to, for example, reuse some data that I wrote with Databricks into my Azure storage account, uh, I can just, do something called create a shortcut. So think of, you know, when you have shortcuts on your local Windows Explorer, right? You can just have a folder, you can create a shortcut to it. You're not actually copying any data, you're just pointing to the original folder, but you can access it from like different locations. Shortcuts over here do the same thing. So if I have, if I'm working with Databricks and I have some data that's written into my storage account, I can just say, okay, let me create a shortcut inside my lake house. Now I can access that data um, as though it's natively part of Fabric. I can re refer to it in the same exact way. So I can just write lake house slash table name slash or slash folder name. And it doesn't matter whether it's a shortcut in Amazon and Azure or it's native. I refer to all that data the exact same way. I can still discover it in Power BI, all of that goodness. Uh, but the data doesn't actually have to physically move anywhere. So that's the other kind of side of it is you can either copy the data into one lake. You can access the data that you've copied into one lake from anywhere. And then if you write data back in, you don't even have to copy, like you don't even have to physically copy the data into one leg. You can just use your existing storage account and then just have it appear via shortcuts. Um, okay. 
So are there fabric developer licenses for non-production testing and exploring? Um, there are, we're going to um, firstly offer a trial that is um, free for 60 days. So you can get started with fabric and just try it out and use it. And um, you know, for 60 days, you don't have to pay anything. And then Fabric is going to both have the reserved instance model that you you know we have today with Power BI, and it's also going to have um, a pay as you go model for you know we we can start maybe doing some um, potentially testing. And the SKUs we're going to start with are going to be much lower than which we start with Power BI. So with Power BI we start with a P1 SKU that's the five thousand dollars a month. Um, with Fabric the SKU is going to I don't think we've disclosed the official pricing yet. It should be coming soon, but. Uh, what I can share with you right now is that the SKU size in terms of the entry point uh, is going to be much, much uh, lower than the $5,000 entry point. Um, and that's going to be, I think, a really good starting point for kind of more of those testing um, workloads uh, for you to use. Um, OK, so then Harry is asking, are there any big things on the public roadmap for upcoming Fabric releases? Uh, yes, we have. Plenty of exciting things that are coming. Um, I will have to. I'll do this after the call. Um, we ha we have published release notes, which basically kind of very similar to what we do with Power BI, right? So just like you get like your six to twelve month publicly facing roadmap, you're gonna get the same thing with Fabric, where we're gonna publish our release notes um, ahead of time, and you're gonna get an idea of what what things are coming for the next six to twelve months. Um, we're also going to have monthly blogs, of course, just like we have with Power BI, where you're going to get, hey, what are the you know new uh, exciting updates that are coming every month? Uh, so in terms of some of the exciting things that are coming that I can talk to, and then I'll dig up the release notes, so you can actually take a look at yourself. Uh, one is, of course, I think the most anticipated feature <laughs> that we're working towards is that one security feature. We know we hear you all loud and clear. We really want to get that one security. Um, up and coming. So uh, that is something that we're working on and we hope that we'll have that object um, and folder level security by GA. Uh, some of the other things we're working on that are uh, we know are very important to our enterprises is all the different se other security features like managed VNet support, private links, uh, which we know are important for getting things into production. I can't share dates around those yet, but we are you know actively working on those. We're working on uh, you know, a lot of these platform integrations that we've talked about, completing them to really fulfill this promise, right? So, for example, right now CI/CD is for Power BI, but of course we're working on adding CI/CD support to all of these different workloads uh, that you see over here. Uh, so that's something that's coming. Now, from the I, I do work on the data engineering and data science side, so I do want to just selfishly call out some of the features I'm excited about. Um, over here that I think are kind of worth mentioning. Uh, so, um, you know, one thing that we're, for example, adding is we're, we're working on a completely new um, artifact in the workspace called the environment. So the environment is, it's more for the data engineering for Sana, but it's basically just like I have a notebook, I'll have an environment artifact where I can install all my libraries, I can configure all my Spark properties, I can have shared files, uh, and I can just attach that uh, to my notebook um, so if I want to have notebooks that have different libraries or different settings or different configurations or different even hardware, um, I can really get into granular control um, with that. And that's something that data engineers are very excited about. Uh, more on the um, Power BI side, something we are working on, which I think is going to be pretty cool, is we call it Notebook in an App. So just like you have Power BI apps where you can have like your reports and dashboards, we're going to also have notebooks that can be part of them more it's like a storytelling or documentation or maybe uh, something where you want to add a little bit or sprinkle some advanced analytics into your apps. Uh, so that's kind of coming a little bit later. But the idea with it would be that, I don't know, imagine you have some forecast, right, or some simulation you want to include as part of your uh, as part of the content that you share with your business users. Maybe that's a little bit hard and tricky at the moment to build into Power BI. Well, you could add a page for your notebook consumption only that you know your users could interact with. So that's something I'm pretty excited about um, getting in. Uh, one area that uh, I'm excited about from the data science space, um, which again is related to Power BI, is what we call a semantic link. So at the moment, when you have a data scientist and a data analyst who need to work together, that can be a little bit challenging in terms of especially when it comes to things like data sharing and all of that. 
So what Semantic Link basically offers is really bridging the gap between uh, these two user groups. So imagine you have your Power BI data model. You'll be able to connect to that data model directly through Python and inside, inside your notebook. Uh, you'll be able to create like calculated tables on the fly. So you'll be able to say, hey, I want this measure evaluated at this level of granularity. You get a data frame inside your notebook. You can now go and, uh, for example, I don't know, add a forecast uh, to that, right? Enrich your, enrich your data frame. And by the way, it's all working on top of one lake, right? So you can get that data back into one lake and back into your Power BI report in this kind of nice little loop. Uh, and so that's kind of, we feel a pretty neat way for, um, you know, as a Python user, I don't have to go and recreate business logic, which is much easier to often define in something like DAX, right? And I can just use that data um, and kind of uh, collaborate. But, you know, I've also heard use cases like, oh, I can now use this for my data set validation, right? So my data set refreshes, I have the notebook run, check if there's any errors, missing values. Um, so it kind of gives, uh, bri you know, bridges these gaps a little bit more. So I think that's the other thing I want to call out generally, as you'll see as a theme with Fabric is it's not just about making things work on top of a common platform, but really thinking about what's the end-to-end -end story between all of these different workloads. So how can the data scientist and the BI user start to work and collaborate more closely together? How can the data warehousing and the Spark user work on top of the same data and the same environment? So it's really about thinking about those handoffs as well. And you'll see a lot of investment um, through that as well. Uh, so yeah, those are just a couple of couple of small highlights I wanted to call out. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Oh, well, there's a lot more questions, I think. So I'm gonna <laughs> need to speed up. Um, okay, two questions about getting started. For someone familiar with Power BI, what do you recommend as our next steps? Uh, understand how Power BI works with Fabric spin up a trial and use Copilot for someone familiar with Power BI, but interested in learning more in the data engineering side, where to start first. Okay, so um, I do have a recommendation for that. I would uh, I, I would start with some of these end-to-end -end tutorials that we've put together. Uh, we've been working very hard on these tutorials. Uh, we've been trialing them with private preview customers and uh, ironing out all of the different like um, uh, edges. and. What, you're basically, what we've basically done together as a team is said, okay, what are the happy paths we want to enable for customers who want to use Fabric? What are the most common workflows that we think people would do? So for example, with the lake house, right, we think that a really neat way that people could use the lake house is they can use pipelines and data flows to get the data in. They can use these shortcuts we talked about. They can now work with data flows and notebooks to iterate on top of it. And they can now use Power BI with direct lake mode um, use the TDS endpoint. So this is like, for example, a reference architecture. And you'll see basically it's um, the tutorial starts with a really, each tutorial starts with like the basic, most common happy path we want people to set up. So we'll start with things like data flows. Uh, we'll start with, um, you know, the kind of the easy path for an onboarding experience from a Power BI customer. Um, and these should not be too like time consuming, too complex. They should be something that we hope that someone can put together in a day or so. So I would maybe start with something like this tutorial. It'll give you a feel for some of the different um, components. And by the end of it, you'll basically have, you know, a Power BI report that's working with all the goodness of direct lake mode with um, with with a lake house, with a SQL endpoint, that, you know, spun up. So something like that, I think is, and maybe, sorry, maybe that like has already been started, <laughs> some has, has already been shared somewhere. But this is where I would personally start. And, and I think it also answers the second question of, hey, I want to get in more, a little bit more into data engineering. You know, how do I get started? Um, I shared on, I'm going to go to Twitter because I shared this out yesterday and I just wanted to get the link quickly. You know, we also have things like um, tutorials for more like specific Python or R, right? So like maybe if you're an R user, you're familiar with R, here's like a tutorial you could do on building an avocado price predictor, you know, very, very important key business problem you might be <laughs> looking to get into, right? And you have all the sample code, you can see how you can build graphics, um, how you can kind of, uh, you know, work with everything all the way from loading the data. So something like this might be another, you know, cool place to get started. It's just like, okay, let's go and build something out end to end and start getting a little bit more familiar with, okay, how do I think about, how do I use these notebooks? How do I start, you know, onboarding on, on some of these things? Uh, and if you have any feedback on the tutorials, please, please do share those with us as well. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, Jordan, you shared also a great link on some of the trainings. So the, the, we also have these learning paths that have been, um, you know, shared out where you can start looking at 
some of these, you know, completing some of these different experiences, whether it's getting started, uh, working with the lake house, working with data factory. So if there's something you want to dig into, they're usually about an hour ish long. Uh, you can kind of, uh, you know, so we, we, lots of, lots of content. I think that, um, users can get started with. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Sorry, I'm just scrolling back up. Um, okay, lots of questions. Okay, so, okay, we've got back up here. Um, can you post these links? If we have premium, do we get fabric? Yes, if you have premium, you do get fabric. You can turn it on today if you want. By default, it is off for the first 30 days to give uh, admins an opportunity to say whether they want it turned on or off by default. But um, it will, so it will get turned on by default in 30 days. But if you want to get started with it sooner, you can go and turn it on um, yourself as well. Um, okay. And if you have a capacity, um, so if you're not an admin of the tenant, but you have a capacity, you can also just turn it on for a specific capacity. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so is there any guidance for hybrid or multi-cloud? I'm assuming key approach would be used to use Parquet or Delta Lake file formats, but that, what else can we do to manage data outside of Azure native SaaS? So that's where I think that one lake story really comes in with the shortcuts. Uh, one lake is multi-cloud. It does support, um, right now it does support Amazon S3 um which you can see over here oh i did have a slide on domains okay well i should have checked this slide <laughs> but there we go um and we even have the gif okay sorry i'm jumping around but this is the gif i was looking for earlier where you can see we've got our uh, nice domains and i can go and navigate to the finance domain and um i can navigate you know through all of them and all my content uh, changes so should have checked this one. Okay, let's go back to shortcuts. So shortcuts, yes. So this is where, um, you know, one like as, as I mentioned, multi-cloud. So if you, you can bring data in from other places. If that data isn't in Delta Parquet, then you can bring it as is and then use Fabric to transform that data into that Delta Parquet format. Um, but uh, yeah, this is basically kind of our story for the hybrid or, or, or multi-cloud uh, basically side of things. Um, okay, and da -da -da, will we be adding end user domain portals, welcome pages for report consumers? Um, so will you be adding end user domain portals? Okay, so the drop down, yeah, the drop, the drop down is intended for data developers. Um, I think the domain portals is really more of what we saw there. Like this would be the more the end user consumption experience. Right, where if I'm an end user, I can come in and see the data. The domains are more like business user focused. But if there's improvements that we could do here, I'm definitely very open to feedback as how we could make this more user friendly. Um, okay. Um, is there a version control for fabric artifacts like the, like data engineering flows? Uh, yeah, that is coming. Uh, we are adding both Git integration and deployment pipeline support for all artifacts. Um, the intention is to have these if we can by GA. So and and you know for the data engineering side, I can speak to that. We are thinking through carefully how we can ensure we can support uh, you know things like uh, this is one of the reasons actually we introduced this concept of an environment art or we are going to introduce this environment artifact is that I can also version control things like my libraries and my Spark configurations and the Spark settings and and the hardware versions and stuff so that. The runtime version so that um you know those things can also be part of my version control as i deploy between environments i can I make sure my libraries go between one environment to the other we're working with the um deployment pipelines team to ensure that we can have things like parameterization rules so if i go from dev to test to prod if i want things to point to different places you know we can kind of support that so it's coming um it's in the works uh, basically, um, does Fabric support blob storage of different types, such as uh, hot, warm, or cold? Uh, so, Harry, do you want to elaborate on that question? Do you mean like, do we support like hot pass versus cold pass for like real time versus batch, or do you mean um, different? I'm I'm not sure if I understand fully what you mean by hot blob storage versus cold blob storage in this case. 
and it, feel free to either go off mute or you can elaborate on the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. I just posted a link to what I meant by the tiers. If you go into the Azure storage, there's hot, cool, cold, and archive. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I'm Thank not you. sure at the top of my head. I'll have to double check with the one link team. So maybe I can get back to you on that one. Um, so data lakes are typically schema on read. Does Fabric have a schema exploration tool? So inside the lake house, you can see the schema of the data. So if we jump back into a lake house for a second, uh, you should be able to get a preview of the table, but also get a preview of um, basically like the, the schema of the data as well. If um, And we're gonna be continuously kind of improving uh, this experience to kind of give you like more more insights and more information and kind of the, uh, in the, in the kind of this lake house explorer view. Um, okay, and this fabric support using schema management, using something like Apache Abro. Um, so, I mean, inside the notebook, you can, if there's any libraries you want to use for uh, managing your schemas, you can absolutely install those and use those. Uh, we don't have any like native experiences apart from kind of what I showed you here, but if there's features that you're looking for, the other great thing we do have now is um, just like we have with Power BI, and um, we do have now Fabric Ideas, which is uh, just going to be blatantly advertising that for a second. Um, so you can you know go and post, let's say, your data engineering ideas, for example. For those of you who are on Twitter, Min has been, you know, actively, uh, let's say, advertising this DuckDB, you know, installed into the default uh, Python runtime. Currently, that is the winning idea. We've got some deep with PowerShell notebook kernel. So, um, just as a blatant sort of advertisement, please do post your ideas if there's things that you would like have better support for for data engineering or for any of these workloads. Um, and we'll definitely evaluate the ideas and figure out how we can keep improving these experiences based on your feedback. So if there's things we are not seeing now, uh, please let us know what we can do to improve things. Um, okay, so, okay, so I do wanna, I know we have five minutes, so I'm gonna try to go through a little bit faster. Um, so, um, can shortcuts replace on-premise gateways? Um, shortcuts currently are to storage accounts, so they're not uh, necessarily to um, like data you might have on-premises, but we are looking at some solutions on how we can make it easier to get data that is from on-prem, so kind of stay tuned for that, I would say. Does Fabric, the engineering support or connected data streaming tools like uh, Kafka, Spark streaming? Uh, yeah, so we do support Spark streaming, um, and all the, you know, anything that Spark connects to, we basically support. We've actually improved the Spark streaming support inside Fabric quite a bit. Uh, because we now have um, more resilience streaming jobs, which means you don't have to restart them every seven days to have them running. They'll just run continuously. And we also have Custom for, that's kind of our specialized streaming um, platform as well. And we're going to also be bringing um, more capabilities there. So I would also encourage you to kind of take a look at the real-time analytics kind of um, uh, page with, with Custom. This is kind of our, you know, a specialized kind of area for, for, for that as well. Um, and then does Fabric connect to all Azure storage tiers? I believe so. Again, I'll double check with Josh, but yes, I believe so. And our Fabric notebooks using Jupyter Lab, uh, they're using their, uh, the underlying notebooks are actually Azure notebooks. Um, that's kind of, we're collaborating very closely with the Azure notebooks team. Uh, and so this is built on top of the Azure notebook uh, capabilities. But you can, uh, by the way, uh, we do have VS Code integration, so you can open up your notebooks locally and work um, in, you know, in, in VS Code as well if you'd prefer to do that, if you're more opinionated about the tools you want to use. Um, okay. Um, um, let's see. Does Fabric support loading our data to a Fabric warehouse, lake house via Gen 2 data flow or pipeline from an on-premises SQL database? 
Um, so you want to you support loading our data to a like this fabric to a fabric warehouse. I see. So you want to bring data into a fabric warehouse via Gen2. Um, so I'll have to double check whether there's a Gen2 connector. Basically, we support whatever data flow and pipeline connectivity we do have uh, inside the product. So I kind of check out the connectors. We are working on a generally, what I would say is we're working on a migration story from Gen2 into Fabric. So there's going to be a much better way to get your data from Gen2 directly into Fabric, but that's a little bit further out. But that is a very top of mind scenario for us. Um, and we are, you know, definitely making a lot of investment in that space uh, so that, you know, you, we, we know that we, we, we don't want to, you know, and we want to make it easy for you to be able to reuse your existing investments and be able to build on top of those existing investments. So that is a, top priority for for the team and as soon as we have more to share we'll we'll definitely share you know with the broader community um uh, so where does the runtime execute for r can you load your own packages into your r code uh yeah we do have library management for r so it's it's we are using spark r uh so we are it's part of it's baked into our runtime basically in in spark um and so everything gets executed as part of your spark workload and we do support our library installations um, as well. Um, and then when will uh, Fabric be on by default? 30 days after, I believe, June 1st, I believe at the end, of, I believe by at the beginning of July, you can turn it off if you do not want it to be turned on by default. You can go into your tenant settings and, and turn it off. That's why we have that 30 day. Um, okay, so I know there's more questions. I, I do want to be respectful of your time. Um, so, you know, happy to follow up with anyone and have like conversations, you know, in the future. So please let me know if there's more I can help with. Um, really appreciate you bringing your questions to me because I really didn't want to present for an hour. I really wanted this to be more interactive. So thank you so much. Um, and Eamon, I do see you have your hand up. Uh, wasn't sure if you had a, or was that? No, just saying thanks. Oh. Missed that. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh yeah. Okay. Sometimes yeah, I know those those buttons are really close together. <laughs> I always raise my hand instead of like <laughs> clap as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for yeah for making the session super interactive and fun for me as well. Um, and yeah, please share your feedback. Share it, you know by email, communities, posts, uh, social media ideas. We are all monitoring all of these very very actively, so we really appreciate um, uh, you know your your involvement and your feedback. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> this is great. And I uh, appreciate you uh, to bring you in, uh, Justina. This is amazing. It's, uh, as I mentioned to every single community and teams, it's great to be around data analytics and AI. Uh, after build announcement, so this is this is pretty excitement. And you know, uh, for everyone in this community, as Justina mentioned, please provide feedback. This is great for all of us. This is coming as a really strong platform. So thank you very much for everyone to share uh, the meeting today. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye.